Hello, Bond fans, and welcome once again. So, I mean, I've said this time and time again in other videos, but r truly one of my favourite things about the James Bond video game series is how the release of the games often helped bridge the gaps between the film releases so well. I feel this was most felt during the Pierce Brosnan era, which was undoubtedly the golden age for Bond video games, and after Quantum of Solace it was uncertain whether or not there would be Bond games with original stories anymore. Would all future Bond games be tie-ins with films in the series? Well, during the dry spell between Quantum of Solace and Skyfall, we received a resounding no to that question, as in 2010 not one, but two Bond games were released. An update of the classic N64 Goldeneye, and an original story concept with Bloodstone, written by veteran Bond scribe Bruce Firestein, no less. Now, I've made it clear in the past that I'm much prefer Bond games to have their own unique stories, so I was super stoked to be getting a new Craig adventure with no movie on the horizon in November 2010. But was Bloodstone worth the hype? Did it live up to the classic Brosnan EA 007 adventures? Well, that's what we're going to be taking a look at today as we look at James Bond 007 Bloodstone. The game begins and we go straight into a cutscene set in Athens, where various world leaders are assembling for a G20 summit. Dear M, voiced by Judy Dench, is there. Because at this point in the film series, M was truly a micromanager, refusing to delegate such a position to a subordinate, but no, instead personally overseeing the anti-terrorist security at the summit. I want you to cancel the photo op. Now. Impossible. You have to have some faith, some trust in my ability to protect them. You can keep your faith. I put my trust in Bond. M tells Bond, voiced by Daniel Craig, to head to the boat of a man named Greco, whom is suspected of planning an attack. Not that the sweaty, big gutted local security believe her, and uh, with that, Bond parachutes into the first playable level aboard Greco's boat. Now, a few things to get used to, as with every first level of a game, but the most notable being that we are back in third person perspective. While I'll always be more of a fan of first person, it's undeniable that the Bond game series gels better with its cinematic counterparts in third person, and it gives actors Vision the chance to show off their great Daniel Craig model. Everything or Nothing is largely considered one of the very best Bond games, and Bloodstone has a very similar feel, right down to the lock-on shooting system and the ability to take down enemies with a Connery-style judo chop. The first level takes place aboard Greco's lovely yacht, as Bond fights his way to apprehend the terrorist, eventually prompting a speedboat chase. Oh yes, I was so ecstatic to see the return of driving levels to a James Bond video game. Quantum of Solace, while a good game in its own right, suffered deeply from not having this kind of variety of gameplay, so I'm super, super happy to see it return in Bloodstone. The speedboat chase quickly becomes a car chase as Bond beats up Greco and commandeers his Aston Martin to chase down an explosive vehicle heading for the summit. Players note that it is impossible to run over Greco here, despite how much the guy deserved not to live anymore. Unlike the gadget-laden driving levels of the Brosnan era, Craig's Aston Martins are gadgetless here. I don't think it's so much a problem for this level especially, but I'll talk a bit more later on about how I think the lack of gadgets of the Craig era does do a detriment to the enjoyment of the games of his era. Bond succeeds in stopping the terrorists, and we get a pretty cute scene between Bond and M. Nice to see you, 007. I was worried that you wouldn't make it in time. Well, that makes two of us. Well done. Thank you. May I get you something to drink? Yes, I'll have a bourbon, neat. And what can I provide for the gentleman? I'll have... You'll have a vodka martini. Actually, I want a Heineken. They're not sponsoring the game, 007. Then screw it, Martini it is. Up next is a pretty nice title sequence with an original song, but unlike the bizarre selection for the last game, this one is actually sung by someone I know, Joss Stone. I actually really like this song and I really like this sequence, and you know what, take it all, is a very close rival to Everything or Nothing as being the best original song ever written for a James Bond video game. 
after the credits, we go straight to a cutscene, and uncharacteristically of Craig's Bond, he has some unknown lady in his bed. It's a nice little classic Bondism that I'm happy made it into the game. The same could not be said for the gun barrel sequence, though, which is annoyingly absent from the game in every way. Anyway, Bond gets a call from M, who exposits that a bioweapons maker named Dr. Tedworth has vanished. Bond is sent to Istanbul to investigate and to make sure that the Doctor's chemical warfare research hasn't been stolen. So it's off to Istanbul as the player controls Bond sporting a fabulous Shumper combo, by the way, um, around a construction site where Dr. Tedworth's phone was picked up. You! Stop! Where do you think you're going? Dr. Bond. British Museum. Architectural Heritage Foundation. Here to study your preservation efforts. Nah. You can call the Turkish Ministry of Culture. I don't care. Nobody goes down there without a hard hat. Of course. Safety first. Bill Tanner, voiced by Rory Kinnear, directs you around to use your smartphone to search for evidence. The device also allows Bond to locate enemies and even see what weapons they're holding, apparently. Another game where Bond's smartphone does everything? I mean, you know, I mean, I know that smartphones are amazing devices, but I would appreciate some kind of variety in the gadgets. I mean, for God's sake, I mean, you know, give him a, a good old laser watch. The laser watch is a tried and tested thing. I mean, God, I, I mean, smartphones, yeah, they're wonderful, but they can't just be the source of all future Bond gadgets, can they? Or maybe they can, and maybe we should go back and digitally edit the older Bond films to ensure that it is only ever a smartphone that Bond uses to get himself out of sticky situations. Anyway, things quickly get exciting as it turns out pretty much everyone in the construction site wants Bond dead. Maybe he should have worn that hard hat after all. Construction workers are clearly notoriously offended when their safety regulations are mocked in this way. The level allows a showcase of the game's takedown techniques as Bond blasts his way through a quite impressive and nicely lit construction site and underground catacombs. There's an especially tense and visually stimulating sequence here where Bond has to outrun a giant uh, tunnel digger thing. Not quite sure what it is, but it's basically like a mahoosive version of the CVAC drill from Tomorrow Never Dies, Bond eventually stumbles upon several dead or dying chemical weapons experts along the way, including one guy who's just hell-bent on being a martyr. Who did this to you? Bernin. Uh, his name is Bernin. Uh, he wanted my research. My formulas. For bioweapons. We've got to get you out of here. I'll never make it. The only way is to climb out. But it's not too late. Maybe you can still save Tedworth. But I mean, you're, you're, you're still alive and you're not bleeding out, so you might have a good chance. I mean, the way out is just so- No, no, it's too late. It's too late for me. <laughs> but I mean, you're not like bleeding out or anything. You're still alive. Like, it's, you know, you do have a, 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 sh a chance. No, just leave me, leave me. Oh. Are you really sure you don't just want me to, you know- Enough. Leave me to my tribulation. Tell my family I love them. <laughs> well, all right then, whatever. <sighs> Christ, is that drill? Um, excuse me, sorry, I, I feel better now. Uh. Tedworth is being tortured by a man named Burnin when Bond finds him in his short mere seconds before 007 reveals himself. Uh, Bond gives chase to Burnin, which leads into the next level of thrilling chase through the streets of Istanbul in Bond's Aston Martin DB5. Not quite sure why it's there. I thought Bond had arrived in his vanquish. Uh, never mind. Um, I don't care because it's Bond behind the wheel of a DB5, so naturally we all love it, right? Um, even if I'm pretty sure we had a similar setup in the same city just two games ago. As thrilled as I am to be controlling a DB5 in a thrilling chase, I do wish there was a bit more to the driving levels of this game rather than just high-speed chasing. Literally every driving level in this game is you racing to reach a certain point and if you slow down or divert from the track then it's automatic game over. I don't know, I prefer the driving levels of Everything or Nothing and From Russia With Love where you're allowed to take your time and explore a bit, take in the level. Maybe that's just a byproduct of the lack of gadgets in this game though. Uh, anyway, after crashing someone's Aston Martin uh, and a bit more shooting, Bond reaches Burnin who passes Dr. Tedworth's research to a helicopter pilot before an interrogation by Bond. I want a name. Who are you working for? Never. Let's try that again. Who is it? Who hired you? Give me the name. Pomeroff. 
Stefan Pomeroff. And where's he taking those papers? I don't know. I've told you everything I know. Please! Please, let me go. I'm no good to you anymore. You got that right. Okay, love that moment. The cold kill is brilliant, but I, I, I mean, to be honest, I'm a little bit worried at this stage. I mean, at this stage, the game has largely just been about chasing one guy, catching him, getting a name, killing him, chasing another guy, catching him, killing him, taking it. And it's getting a bit repetitive, like the lack of a, a, a good central main villain to sort of pin a plot around. Um, it's becoming quite noticeable now. Uh, I mean, this Pomerov chap has come up, so I'm hoping that he's going to be that kind of, you know, the main villain of the game, so to speak. Um, because, to be honest, it's hard keeping up with all these names and middle-aged guys. However, the same could not be said of the main Bond girl, who becomes very apparent in the next scene as none other than Nicole Hunter, played by Joss Stone, a self-confessed it-girl socialite who is to act as Bond's escort for a mission to Monaco due to her connection with Pomerov. Turns out she's working for MI6 as repayment for tax and smuggling offences, which is a nice touch. Would you like to drive? I feel much safer with a man behind the wheel. Huh, not much of a feminist, is she? The Monaco level fulfills the token need for an environment in which Bond can wear his trademark tux and earwig into the idle conversations of fellow partygoers. I'm surprised it's still so warm up here. This is probably a good point for me to talk about another of Bond's smartphones, apparent superpowers, which involves the ability to scan certain items in the environment and give some information on those items. And these range from plot relevant tidbits to curious pieces of pointless filler. This bronze statue was offered as a gift by an unknown Italian collector. Huh. Well, thanks for drawing the player's attention to the nude statue. I'm sure whoever designed the thing is very happy with that. What is it with Bond games and nude statues? Not sure if that one is intended as a reference to the similar Malprave statue in Agent of Fire, but I like to think it might be. Anyway, after blasting his way through the casino and stealing some documents from Pomerol's safe, there's more exposition with M, who has a very interesting way of pronouncing Nicole. Bond, are you there? Yes, M. Right here. Nicole? Nicole? Nicole also does her best to set women's rights back by decades by making a comment about Bond's drink here. Here, see if this is dry enough for you. What are you drinking? Same thing. Straight. I was never one for girly drinks. Well, isn't that just the truth? Because obviously girls only like pink things, don't they? Like pink and cats and champagne and kitchens and rainbows and girly pink. Pink, fluffy, pink, pink. Anyway, M lets us all know that Pomerov has been buying chemical weapons equipment, so Bond and Nicola are ordered to head to Pomerov's refinery in Siberia. I'm gonna need a flight, ground transportation, a local contact. And... Wait, wait, not so fast. I mean, come on, James, I'm only a woman, for goodness sake. Unless it's cooking or cleaning, I don't think my tiny little feeble female brain could possibly process more than one thing at a time. Despite her overly girly nature, I actually think that Bond and Nicole have some good interplay here. Well, how do you think I'm going to get you to Siberia? Oh, let me guess. A friend of yours owns a plane? May I speak with Rudolph, please? Why am I not surprised? <laughs> You're going to love it. It's got a shower, a wine cellar, and the most unbelievable circular bed. Circular bed? I'm not quite sure why that's a major selling point. Now, a hexagonal bed. Oh, that would be something to write home about. It's actually something of a refreshing change for a Bond girl to be a more, so, well, girly sort of girl instead of trying to be Bond's equal all the time. The pair make it to Pomerob's factory in Siberia, which is probably my favourite setting of the entire game. I love the grey, industrial, the snow, the monuments. This is a really cool location that requires stealth tactics, uh, you know, and pretty good spy work to achieve Bond's objective of posing as Nicole's bodyguard to poke around the factory and hack the facility's mainframe to find out what Pomerov is up to with Tedworth's research. This, of course, leads to a whole lot of shooting action around the refinery, and just to reiterate, the level design and environment here are just so awesome. I don't know if it's just the Russian setting, but this part of the game has an almost golden eye feel to it. I love it whenever Bond finds himself in Russia, and this is no exception. Bond retrieves the information he needs and sets the refinery to blow. Nicole actually gets behind the wheel of a car in order to extract Bond. Move over! I'll drive! Oh, thank goodness my fairly feeble female hands could barely take the strain of gripping the wheel much longer! 
This speeds us into the next level as the pair race to stop Pomorov's escape train, which is carrying several chemical weapons that are to be taken out of the country. It's another cool driving level, but the lack of any gadgets at all really starts to show here. There are trucks, helicopters, perilous ice to deal with, all in a regular old Aston Martin, which must have pretty amazing traction to deal with all this ice. Maybe it's just because it reminds me so much of that awesome Aston on Ice level from Nightfire, which makes great Great use of missiles and oil slicks, Q smoke and the like. You know, I just, I feel like there's just something missing from this game. But this is the Daniel Craig era pre-Skyfall, so obviously there are no gadgets. <laughs> In fact, I, I don't even know what that word means. Gadgets? Like, what even is a gadget? I mean, it's not as if that was there for a big part of this series, is it? <laughs> Pomerov's train makes it to the harbour and the weapons are moved to a speeding hovercraft, which is where the next level takes place, continuing the absolutely wonderful set design established in the refinery level. This is another very action-focused level and it's great zipping around the ship, there's a section where you pilot a turret weapon to destroy incoming missiles, all this action in Siberia is just fantastic and when I was playing this game for the first time, you know, back in the day, I was so relieved for the first time since... 2005's From Russia With Love, I was genuinely loving a Bond game again. The level culminates with some cutscene fisticuffs, uh, Pomerov meeting his end by falling out of the plane, and the bioweapons are firmly secured. Which is all very well and good, but I kind of thought that Pomerov was the main baddie of the game, and we still have quite a few levels remaining. There's a cutscene where a broken armed Nicole departs ways with Bond, who then calls M and hypothesizes that the anonymous tip off that MI6 received about the bioweapons couldn't have come from Tedworth and must have come from someone else who wanted MI6 to take out Pomerov. Bond wants to find out who and why, so Tanner and Q Branch analyze a phone that Bond picked up from one of the baddies in Istanbul, which leads 007 to Colonel Ping? Good morning, Colonel Ping. Good morning. Commander Bond. To what do I owe the pleasure of this phone call? I'd like to know why a top Chinese agent was trying to contact a courier in Istanbul. Perhaps it's the same reason a British agent was following him. Are you suggesting an alliance? You'll find me at the aquarium in Bangkok tomorrow night. Come alone. It's the only way I can guarantee your safety. Funny. I was just going to issue the same warning to you. So now Bond's heading off to Thailand to meet this Ping guy, and I mean, God, if the if the story of the game has one major flaw, it is just this: that the whole game is just Bond going down a chain of people, seemingly never ending, without ever quite getting to the top. Just when you sort of settle in, think you know who the big bad of the story is, Bond kills them and then there's someone else above them, I'd much rather we just knew who the main villain was from early on so that we know what Bond's end goal is. At the moment it's just new name after new name and suddenly it's all about this Colonel Ping guy, but at least Bond first has the opportunity to play the tourist and enjoy the massive Atlantis inspired aquarium. I'm not sure any aquarium on Earth actually has capacity for two blue whales but it's a super cool visual nonetheless. Bond meets with Ping, who waffles on about China's population problems, and I honestly lose what the plot is here. I, I mean, there's a guy called Rack, who is stealing bioweapon secrets and selling them to the highest bidder or something. I honestly start to not care around this point. Every single level has its own set of quite dull friends and foes, and none of them, except Joss Stone's Nicole, really make much of an impression, which is why it's no loss to the game that Ping is taken out, so Bond pursues his assassin, across the rooftops of Bangkok in a cool level very reminiscent of the chase sequence from the start of Casino Royale, right down to Bond commandeering a construction vehicle as part of the action. The chase ends in a crash and Bond continues his investigation into this rack chap by uh, having to go and meet a contact named Silk who owns a nightclub nearby and apparently has some intel. How many more names am I expected to learn to keep up with this plot? I hate to sound like a complete downer, but the game pretty much peaked for me in Siberia. All this stuff in Thailand is quite dull, and by this point I'm really sick of levels being entirely revolving around going from 30-something shifty guy to 30-something shifty guy who all behave in exactly the same suspicious way. So Bond makes it to Silk's nightclub, who gives Bond the location of a boathouse that Rack owns in Bangkok before dobbing him in, uh, prompting more shooting through the streets of Thailand, leading to a chase with Rack, who we 
NPC has a scar and a milky eye, so I'm guessing he must be the main baddie of the game then, if he has those physical features. Um, the game does its best to differentiate between all these guys that Bond meets, but none of them are actually played by any known actor, so it's genuinely hard to keep track of who they are, so a milky eye and a scar is okay by me. I know about the kidnappings, the bioweapons, the missing researchers. I'll give you one last chance, Rack. You should have quit while you had the chance. Bond is drugged and wakes up in Burma, where much of the third act of the story takes place. After escaping, capture, and acquiring a weapon, it's off to venture around small ransacked villages and a giant dam. These last few levels are quite tough, really, uh, involving battles with tanks, armoured enemies, and an incredibly frustrating airship. You'd better have some focus aims saved up for this section, because you're gonna need them. Oh, wait, have I talked about focus aims yet? Oh, maybe I haven't. Um, yeah, so one of the, uh, y you know, more interesting combat features of this game is the focus aims, which is basically a bullet time sort of effect where time slows down and Bond can shoot up to three enemies in a uh, you know, very quick succession. It's a cool um, feature and when you have like three saved up and you just let rip on three guys, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, anyway, the whole thing comes to a climax and a final showdown with Rack. <laughs> Help me! You had your chance, Rack. Please, save me. I'll tell you everything. I'll tell you who I'm working with. It's too late. I already know. It's a cool fight, if not disappointing that it came down to a fight with such a mediocre villain, but hey, oh, there's one more level left. Um, as this was a game made after Dying of the Day in Casino Royale, there has to be a double-crossing female villain, so indeed, in a final vehicular chase around Monaco, Nicole is revealed as the one who kidnapped Tedworth and is playing another target. The chase is actually quite formidable, and Nicole can damn well drive fast. Maybe all of her diminishing responsibility through gender stereotyping was nothing more than a ploy! Anyway, after giving Nicole a good ramming with an Aston Martin... Yes, I said ramming. The chase is over and Nicole is frustratingly vague with her confession. You did it for love? <sighs> no. You of all people should know. I didn't want to grow old, alone, and poor. Who? Who is it? It won't make a difference. I want a name. You don't understand. He's everywhere. He's bigger than you. Bigger than MI6, bigger than everything. And he's watching us, right now. There is no escape. Nicole, down, get down! Bond? Are you there? Come in, 007. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. We've been concerned about you, 007. What happened? I'm fine, Em. But I think you're gonna need a new contact in Monaco. If you need me, you know how to reach me. Well, of course I know where to find you, but actually, 007, it would be really good to get some more info on this. What exactly has happened? These reports don't write themselves, you know. so frustrating. These kind of things just make the game's story feel so incomplete. It's so bothered about setting up something else that's never going to come, or, 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 or tying into some grand tapestry of Bond lore when all anyone wants from Bond is a decent standalone story. So that's it, and on to the credits. But as this is a Bond game, there is of course a multiplayer mode, in this case online. Yay! But it's worth us me telling you that, as no one actually plays on it anymore. Boo. Uh, from the memories I have of the mode, it was pretty naff, really. There aren't many player 
double modes, and I think I only ever played Team Deathmatch because that's the only mode that anyone else was actually on. You can also do multiplayer over a local area network, but I just hate that these days pretty much all multiplayer is regulated to online or people in separate rooms, and you just can't play with your mates in the same room anymore, but whatever, I'm an old man, obviously. Um, there are also plenty of trophies and the like to keep you playing the main story of the game after you've finished, but um, uh, there isn't, you know, much else to the game beyond the main story mode. So that's Bloodstone, so far the only Daniel Craig James Bond video game to feature its own original story, and that counts for a lot in my opinion. But, saying that, the story is far from as exciting or well thought out as the stories of Agent Under Fire, Nightfire, or Everything or Nothing. The lack of a clear main villain or goal makes for such a confusing narrative. I mean, you know, fair enough, it's pretty clear until the Siberia section, but then as soon as the bioweapons are recovered, after that, there were a few times when I was playing through and I had to, like, stop and think... Wait, why am I chasing this guy again? And I do largely blame this on the state of the Daniel Craig film series at the time. With Quantum of Solace, it was very unclear what the shape of the next film would be. Would it be its own adventure, or would it be tied in with the events of Quantum, and we'd find out more about that organization? Um, Bloodstone obviously goes down the organization route without ever actually mentioning Quantum, which is quite bizarre. At the time, I was really let down by the lack of resolution and the fact that we'd probably never find out who Nicole was in cahoots with, but playing this game again, now that Spectre is out, and you know, it could be quite reasonably construed that Blofeld was behind the whole thing. I mean, it makes more sense, but you know, obviously, this is retroactive continuity, as I'm pretty confident that they did not think that they were going to get Blofeld back in the main series while this game was being made. The game does suffer from other aspects of the Craig series, lacking in classic Bondian elements. There's no gun barrel at the start, no gadgets, no Bond theme until the very end, the lack of a traditional Bond girl. I mean, heck, it's quite a coup that the game makers got to have that semi naked girl at the very start of the game in at all. I've said it all before, but if there was ever a space where Bond is allowed to be cheesy and a bit self-indulgent and over the top, then it's in the games, and it's a shame that the Craig series of games so far is so intent on keeping the grittier tones of the films of the time uh, when it should just be able to let loose and, you know, be fun, be camp. But whatever, it's cool to have Craig, Dench, and Kinnear back reprising their roles from the films, and I will say that I think Joss Stone is great as Nicole, and despite her putting women's rights back by centuries, she makes for a unique companion to Craig's Bond and her involvement in the story, while obviously just a bit of a Vespa Lind knockoff works well. But what about the gameplay itself? For all the faults with the story, the game is actually really fun to play. The third person view works perfectly, combat systems are fine, and the addition of driving segments must always be applauded in Bond games, even if they're not quite up to the standard set by the previous Bond adventures and uh, EA Games' tenure. I don't know if this is a random thing to praise, but I really love the camera work, especially in this game. It can be still and cinematic when the moment calls for it, but when Bond starts running and leaping from rooftops, it goes all rough and handheld. It's a nice touch and one that really helps sell the cinematic feel of this adventure. It's a shame that this kind of Bond game couldn't continue for, you know, Craig, as despite fairly good reviews, Bloodstone's sales were incredibly poor. So poor it kind of brought about the end of Developer Bazaar, meaning that the supposed sequel to this game was never completed. Bloodstone did really not deserve poor sales. It's a wonderful return to form for the Bond video game series and is regarded by many as the best game of the Craig era so far. I'd go so far to say that it's publicly Activision's own fault that the game failed to make a splash because while Bloodstone was released on PS3 and Xbox 360 in November 2010, there was another Bond game released on exactly the same day for the Wii. Now, I'm not a marketer by any stretch of the imagination, but to me, that sounds like a monumentally stupid idea. Bloodstone was quite simply never allowed to make a splash or create a buzz because pretty much everyone, myself included, was geeking out over the GoldenEye remake that was being released on the Wii that same day. But was everyone right to go crazy for the known quantity? And how the heck do you remake a classic like the N64 GoldenEye? Well, that's what we're going to be looking at next time as we play GoldenEye Reloaded.